Good morning. The first lesson is found in the book of Acts, chapter 4, beginning with verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say any of the things he possessed was his own, but they all had things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all were possessors of lands or houses, sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed them to anyone who had, to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and bought a cer brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who had heard these things, and the young man arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it was about three hours later, when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me, whether you sold the land for so much? She said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed to gather to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, carrying her out, and buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all those who heard these things. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were, excuse me, were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. The word of the Lord. Be to God. The responsive psalm is found in Psalm 34, beginning with verse 1. Please follow the screens. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. Glorify the Lord with me. Let's exalt his name together. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The word of the Lord. For the reading of the gospel. to my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. 
gospel readings found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, beginning with verse 16. Glory to you, Lord. No one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have, will be taken from them. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. And let's pray. Man, I need prayer today because this is a toughie. Lord God, call upon your Holy Spirit to come. Speak your truth among us. Open our ears to hear and give us joy for your word, all of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are in this season uh, during Pentecost where we're, it's, it's, we're calling it Life Elevated. Life Elevated. And uh, obviously that's the Utah slogan, Life Elevated, right? But we're shooting higher than that. We're looking for Kingdom Life Elevated. And one of the qualities and characteristics of Kingdom Life is integrity. So this week is Life Elevated Integrity. Um, a lot of these things, what we're going to find out is... Uh, is if the if the world is how it sh- let's, try, let's try that again. The world's not how it should be. If we want the world to be how it should be, which is life elevated, kingdom kingdom life, then sometimes that requires us to have a shift of mind. You with me? I know I started off confusing, but this, we need a shift of mind. So, for example. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Israelites are about to head into the promised land. God has promised them long life in a land flowing with milk and honey. And of course, the milk part of that, right? Where do you get milk from? Herds and flo- flocks and herds, right? So if you got animals, you got milk. And then the honey, if you have bees, you have crops, right? With me? So how do you have a long life in a a land full of flocks and crops? Be careful how you say that. Flocks and crops. Do you get the best farming equipment? You put in a high-tech irrigation system? You get the best fertilizer? That is that how? No, God says if you want long, if you want to live long and prosper, I always think of Spock when I say that, but if you want to live long and prosper, In the land that I give you, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. It's it's very different. It's a shift in the way we think about things. David said something like that. He said in Psalm 34, whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days. Okay, in other words, live long and prosper, right? If you love life and desire to see many good days, do you listen to your financial advisor and, and develop a, a diverse portfolio? Um, do you listen to your doctor and take lots of vitamins and eat a Mediterranean diet and have 30 minutes of uh, cardio-inducing exercise three times a week? Those are good things. But what David says is, if you want to live long and prosper, keep your tongue from evil Whoops. and your lips from speaking lies. In other words, have integrity. Have godly integrity. Show godly integrity and you'll live long and prosper. It's a shift in the way we think about things. And when we live lives of kingdom integrity, uh, life is elevated beyond what we think is necessary or important to the heights of what God thinks is necessary and important. And that's what we want. Human stuff can be okay sometimes. God's stuff is perfect all the time. And we want to live an elevated life, right? So when we live with godly integrity, it shows respect to God, but it also shows that we are in a strong relationship with God to others. It strengthens our relationship with God, and that shows. So what, first of all, what is integrity? I'm begging you, do not... Anybody watching, do not Google the question, what is integrity? 
because you will get some of the most ridiculous, stupid answers I've ever seen in my life. It, it, the definition is okay, but while some of the things people think integrity is, is way off. Integrity is the quality of being honest or having, a strong, having strong moral principles. So as soon as you start talking about moral principles, God's in that. Because human beings don't come up with morals. Morals are from God, okay? Which makes integrity one of those words like blessed. That God bless you, gazuntai, whatever. That you're suddenly speaking a biblical kind of language. Integrity has to be that because it comes from, morality comes from God. The other definition for integrity, you think of, uh, it, it's kind of scientific, but the state of being whole or undivided. I always think about, you think about metal fatigue, right? If metal gets fatigued, it eventually breaks. I used to throw the hammer. A hammer is a 16 pound ball on the end of a coat hanger. You spin around with this thing. You have to change the wire every once in a while because if you don't change the wire, the wire breaks and you go flying. The, the, the integrity of the wire got, gets bad, right? So united or whole, that is the definition, the other definition of integrity, the state of being whole or undivided. Think about the Titanic. Everybody knows about the Titanic. The Titanic sunk because it hit an iceberg, right? The Titanic sunk because it hit an iceberg. And a lot, most people think that, that when it hit the iceberg, it actually put, that it put a huge gouging hole in the hull of the ship. That's what most people think. But in 97, 1997, uh, USA Today, or yeah, so USA Today, came out with an article. There was a team of divers and scientists. They bombarded the wreckage of the Titanic with sound waves. And what they found out was that the reason the Titanic sunk was not because the iceberg put one giant hole, but actually there were like six narrow slits. Six little narrow slits that sunk the unsinkable ship, right? That caused a lack of integrity in the watertight hold of the ship, and that was enough to bring the ship down, okay? So integrity is a very important thing for us. The gospel today has a great working definition of integrity. And Jesus says to listen very carefully. He says, uh, consider carefully how you listen to this. So he says, no one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light for there's nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be uh, known or brought out into the open. It says, therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have will be taken from them. And most of us look at that and go, oh, that's not fair. But then what is he talking about? If he's talking about integrity, if he's talking about you're a lamp and your job is to give light, your job is to tell the truth, your job is to live uh, the life that God has, has commanded you, that Jesus has modeled for you, that the, the apostles have taught us about. If that's the life that you're living and you're living with integrity, then even to those who have more will be given integrity. But if you're not living with integrity, even what you have, what you think you have will be taken away. And that's just the, the reality of it. Uh, people who live lives that lack integrity can't keep jobs, can't keep relationships, can't keep marriages. Uh, a lack of integrity, is it'll destroy you. But people who live lives of, of integrity and godly integrity, that, that has an impact on the rest of your life, on your daily living, in, in everything that you do. Um, in the Bible, integrity has four synonyms. So the words in the Old Testament and the New Testament that we translate as integrity are also translated into these words. They're synonyms. Purity, wholeness, truth, and oneness. Purity, wholeness, truth, and oneness. So if you want to have 
a, a picture of what the church should look like when it's living in godly integrity, in, 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 a, in, in its highest form of integrity. Then we look back at Acts chapter 4, and uh, Summer read this. It was, now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. They were one, oneness. Okay? Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Well, that's wholeness. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. That's truth. Because the gospel is truth. And great grace was upon them all. And that's purity. Why? Because we don't earn grace. We don't deserve grace. But when God gives us grace, he, doesn't, he gives us his purity. Without, I'm not pure without Jesus. I struggle to be pure with Jesus. But he gives us his purity. All right? Wholeness, oneness, truth, and purity. That is what the church should look like. Now, I've had a lot of people ask me over the years, why did God kill Ananias and Sapphira? Because right? that's what he did, right? I mean, that's, that's, that, no bones about it. It's just, that's what he did. So God's, remember what Jesus said. And this is from John. And this is, applies to the church. Jesus said, I've come to have life that you would have, a, have a abundant life and complete joy. Christ's desire for his bride, the church, for the body of Christ is for the church to have abundant life and complete joy. The problem is lies of any kind, including gossip, exaggeration. Exaggeration is a form of lying. Just remember that. Right? Deception, bad theology, heresy. Why do we have, why, almost every week we either sing or we say a creed. Either the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. We very rarely do the Athanasian Creed, but that's a Lutheran thing too that we can... Uh, but why do we do the creeds? Because they were formed as a defense against heresy. About if, how do you know what, you, what Christians are? Well, these creeds, right? In order for the church... So, so it, we, we, we have to keep the integrity of the church. Lies of any kind can weaken the integrity of the church. It doesn't take much. If we're not paying attention, it doesn't take much, does it, for Satan to sink a ship. And I've, I've told you this before. Every, every church is a ship. Every church is a boat. You know that, right? This room, we call it the sanctuary. It used to be called the nave. All churches used to be built in the form of an upside-down ship because we're supposed to be fishers of... Fishers of people, fishers of men, right? So all the all churches, you think of a church as a ship. Satan can easily sink the ship. Think of the Titanic. What does he do? He comes in. You get a couple of words of bad theology. The next thing, you get a, a little bit of gossip. Then you get a little bit more gossip. And then you get a little more gossip because that's just how gossip is, right? It just multiplies and spreads. And then there's some deception, maybe a little exaggeration. Next thing you know, the church is divided and it sinks. Right? It's, easy, it's easy for Satan to sink a ship if they're not a church, if they're not paying attention. In a lot of ways, the, the beginning of the church in Acts. So here we're, we're just, what are we, a few weeks into the, baby, the birth of the baby brand new church. And basically the disciples, the, we call them the apostles, they're, the, these, they're just doing what Jesus did. This is the same stuff Jesus did while they were walking with him for the three years that led up to his, life, his death, resurrection, and ascension. And they're, but they're, they're, it's forming into a church. And so here's this, the baby church isn't even old enough yet to go and, and, and mature enough yet to walk on its own. And Satan's already come in here with lies. And you have to think of the early church a lot like the Garden of Eden. You with me? The Garden of Eden was this very protected place where God developed the relationship with Adam and Eve. They had everything that they needed, and they were in a comfortable friendship with God. And then Satan comes in with lies, and they believe the lies, and then there's, there's death. There is death that happens in the Garden of Eden. We think, oh, they just got cast out. Well, no. 
actually. When God says, if you eat of this fruit, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, in English it says, and surely, surely you will die. In Hebrew, it's actually the word muth twice. Muth, muth, and dying you will die, or there'll be two types of death. And first, they, they definitely lost their innocence. Their innocence died, right? They, they said, oh, we're naked. Ooh, fig leaves. Their innocence died. But more important than that, worse than that, is that that spirit, that spirit, that it was a pure, clean spirit, that spirit died, and their bodies started to die. So muth, muth, there was two deaths in the Garden of Eden, right off the bat, when, when the lies came in. And then they were cast out of the garden. Well, God is uh, thankfully unwilling to let Satan kill the church before the baby church is even mature enough to stand on its own two feet. Does that make sense? So he protected them. He kept a wall of integrity around the church and he built integrity. And so that in order for the church to have the internal strength of kingdom integrity, it had to learn to it had to learn attention, to be comfortable with God, their friendship with God, but also the fear of the Lord. When we're when we're overly comfortable, and we, you know, and a lot of our praise music, I love praise music, but some of our praise music is a little bit too Jesus is my buddy or romantic, that kind of thing. We get a little too comfortable with the Lord. And we lose the fear of the Lord. You've got to have that tension because never forget that God is God. You with me? God is he's God, you know. He loves you. He wants to hold you. He's your daddy. He's your Abba. But we need to, have, we need to live in that tension with, of awe and reverence at the same time. So that's kind of going on in the early church as well. Paul wrote, I mean David wrote, the fear of the, for fear the Lord... You, his holy people, for those who fear him, lack nothing. So what happened in Acts? Okay, here's the story. The, the, there's, it, it really is hard because uh, with our chapters and verses, we tend to think of chapter 5 as being, oh, this is a new story. But really, you've got to back up, right, to where we started, Summer started reading today in, in the end of chapter 4. And there was this guy, Joseph. And the apostles nicknamed him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And Joseph, or Barnabas, was from Cyprus, from the country of Cyprus. Cyprus was known for being a very, very wealthy country because it was rich in natural resources. It had trees for lumber. It was famous for silver and copper, for fruit and flowers. Every, it's like the land just, just was abundant. Everything just produced from the land. So if you owned land in Cyprus, the, 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 thing, the only thing I can compare it to was if, say, you're a cattle rancher in Texas and you, you, you hit oil on your ranch, that'd be real similar to what it'd be like to own land in Cyprus. And so what uh, Barnabas did was he sold his land. Now he's a foreigner. He's not from Jerusalem. He had to travel to get there. And he wants to be one with this community. One. Oneness, wholeness, purity, and truth. And so he sells his land in Cyprus and he lays the proceeds at the apostles' feet and that was an encouragement to people because he didn't have to do that. Why would he do that? Because he gave his all for the Lord. I always think of the, the, the widow with the copper coins that Jesus, he celebrated her. Why? Because it wasn't because she gave the last of what she had. It's because she gave the life of her. It's the life of her. And he gave the life of himself. He gave his whole life. Everything he was, everything he had, everything anybody com could compare him to, he gave it to Jesus. And, and people were encouraged by that. And then you get to chapter 5, and then there's the word, but. Okay? Now, in some of your translations, it's now. The word in Greek is de, D-E. And it's a comparison word, or, or it, you, often it means moreover. This happened, moreover, this happened, moreover, this happened. You see that a lot in Acts. In this case, but is the best translation. 
Because but is a word of comparison, but it has kind of negative connotations, doesn't it? That was a great term paper, but the margins were way off. Right? That was a good sermon, but it was way too long. Right? Good job, but I could have done better. Okay? There, it's that kind of got that negative comparison connotation to it. And so it says that Barnabas did this, but Ananias and Sapphira. And so you get the sense here that they are jealous of the attention that Barnabas is getting, and he doesn't care about the attention. You know what I mean? And so they, they sell this land, and they, bring the, they don't bring all of the proceeds. They take, keep part of it back, but they tell the apostles that it's all of the proceeds. So they lie. And then, you know, you heard the story, Peter says, it wasn't it yours to give? You could have given any part of it you wanted. Why are you lying to God? You lied to God. And God was unwilling to let there be a division, a, 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 a crack in the integrity of the early church. And so um, Ananias and Sapphira, the Lord protected the church from Satan's motives, Right? Impure motives and impure methods weaken integrity. Are you with me? I'll say impure motives and impure methods weaken integrity. And God saved the church from that for a while. Now, you know, when the church got mature enough to deal with these things, we see it with Paul. He does a lot of disciplining and things like that when you read the epistles. They, they, God allowed, allows us in maturity to care for the church, but he was protecting the church at that time. And the, the big deal here too, we need to live in the tension that God is not only our, our friend, our savior, our redeemer, and our king, but that he's God, right? It's so easy sometimes to forget how big he is when he wants to be so close to us. Be close to him, enjoy that, but never forget how awesome God is. We need to live in that healthy tension that he is, he, he, the fear of the Lord, the respect and awe of the Lord. So you would think that uh, if you're in a church where a couple of people drop dead for lying, that that would keep people away. But what, in reality, what happened was the integrity of the church got stronger the unity of the church got stronger, the oneness of the church got stronger, and the church was highly esteemed, and so was the gospel, and so was the invitation, and then, the, then really more people came to the Lord, not, not more people joined the church, but more people came to the Lord, and all sorts of kingdom stuff started happening even more than it did before. So if you look, so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest, none of the rest, who are the rest? The rest are the ones who are not serious. People like Ananias and Sapphira are, who are using the church for their own benefit. People said, uh-oh, I better check my heart if I'm really doing this for me and not for, the, for God or for the, for the unity of the, of the church, then maybe I'll back off for a little while. And that's what happened. So, some of the, so the integrity of the church got stronger. And it says... Uh, yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Multitudes! In other words, they stopped counting. You notice they got up to about 5,000, and now they just stopped counting. Or people coming to the Lord, both men and women, they've just been counting the men. Now it's, it's getting to the point where they're just not going to count anymore, because it's so many people are coming to the Lord, added to the Lord. So that they brought the sick in, out into the streets and laid them out on beds and cou on couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits. 
and they were all healed. So life was elevated because the church had integrity. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. So how do we live uh, lives of kingdom integrity, of wholeness, oneness, purity, and truth? First, like I've said, we need to have a, a healthy awe and respect of God, right? Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. The next thing is we need to be people of truth. Tell the truth. Don't gossip or exaggerate or deceive. Proverbs 12, 19, truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only a moment. Proverbs 20, 19, a gossip betrays a confidence, so avoid anyone who talks too much. Careful, be, be people of truth. Be people of purity. Keep it pure. Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Proverbs twenty two eleven. 11, one who loves a pure heart and who speaks with grace will have the king for a friend. I love that. Uh, the friendship with the king that's associated with purity. Uh, also, Psalm 119, 9, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word, God's word but living according to the word of God. Oneness. Bring people together. Don't divide. Don't cause fractures. Be people who bring people together in one. Colossians 3.14, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And Philippians 2.2. 2. Uh, Philippians 2, if you have not read Philippians 2, read it. It's one of the early creeds of the church and it's a great way for us to, to this, if we had a, a model for how the church should live, it's Philippians chapter 2. But this, Paul says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. And, and so then be people of wholeness. Work together for good. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Proverbs 15, 27 says, Plans for fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Be part of the wholeness, right? Philippians 2, 3 to 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So uh, an awesome fear, you know, like a respect and awe, fear of the Lord, wholeness, purity, oneness, truth. These are the things that the church can live in to have integrity, godly integrity. And what happens with godly integrity, what happened to the church in Acts is the same thing that will happen to us. If we live in godly integrity like the church in Acts did, what happened with Ananias and Sapphira, the good thing, was people on the outside says, well, look. Those are people who will never lie again, right? These are people who won't lie. So they esteemed them highly. And when they preached the good news, they said, it can't be a lie. It must be the truth because these people would never lie. God doesn't tolerate it when they lie. And then when they extend an invitation, they say, well, this must be a good invitation because it's an invitation given with integrity. You know, when the church is like this, we can give an invitation to anybody and they'll go, hey, I want to be part of that because that's, there's strength and there's wholeness and there's unity and there's truth and there's purity. That's a good thing, right? That's what we aspire to. Life elevated with godly integrity. Lord, teach us godly integrity. Thank you that you love us. Help us to, to walk your path now and always in Jesus' name. Amen.